I'm Marianne Weiss, partner at Weiss Manfredi, and Michael Manfredi and I co-founded uh, our practice. And I'm Michael Manfredi. And uh, both of us uh, have been practicing uh, informally and formally together now for uh, almost two decades, and we both teach and have found that the kind of engagement between practice and academic inquiry have become more and more the focus of our work since so much of our project work has come through competition. One of the things that we like to do, and we started our practice with the idea that it wasn't just architecture, and you know, we've all talked about how architecture and the role of the architect is changing, and for us, one of the things that's become very interesting is the role of the architecture and landscape and infrastructure and how those different disciplines come together. So we're a little unusual, um, at least in terms of small offices, in that we like to grapple with issues of, of engineering and infrastructure and landscape and architecture. We're fundamentally an architectural office, but we try to broaden what the architect can do besides just making a building. That's a very good question. You should answer that first. I'll I think what is architecture is actually a question that becomes broader and broader and in many ways uh, starts to capture what architecture might have meant even during the Renaissance, which is that architecture encompassed everything from art, engineering, urban planning, art, you know, design of buildings, that it became a kind of comprehensive way of shaping what it is we see and inhabit. Arguably, architecture started to become isolated as a terminology, and people would think a tower against the sky, that's architecture. But in fact, it's actually the underpinnings of organization as well, in the way we construct a site, construct a land, construct a city, all taps into what architecture is. In fact, as Michael touched on, we began our practice in some ways with some frustration about the narrow disciplinary definition of architecture, and it seemed to emerge from the kind of codification that schools needed to for administrative reasons to come up with. This is a landscape department, this is architecture, this is urban planning, this is urban design, this is art. Uh, and all of these things across the board had things in common that were being teased apart purposely for really uh, maybe educational administrative purposes. Our own preoccupation had to do with the interstices between all these things, and so arguably our definition of architecture is probably very, very different than somebody else's. But in fact, it really starts to take on the more synthetic possibilities that allow you to determine the where, the how much, and the why you might build in certain areas as opposed to saying it's architecture only. Well, I think that to to further that discussion. I think the thing that we find interesting and in architecture for us is the space between the conventional definition of architecture, just a building, and the world of engineering, the world of the street, or the world of the room. Because sometimes architecture can be made by something very small and it becomes an object that, that unfolds and has bigger, bigger ideas. So for us, the definition of architecture is that or at least the definition that we find most interesting is, is where architecture moves beyond just the definition of a building. And that's what's exciting about, I think, not only exciting for us, but I think exciting about our generation and the work that's being done now um, by other firms around the world. Um, well, I think that, that we're we're politically active and the role of architecture must be to engage society and I think in many ways architects have to by virtue of, of being architects have a social engagement because one of the definitions of architecture is it, it's, it's about making things and spaces for people so the idea of engagement uh, of, a, of a kind of social and political engagement for us is, is absolutely essential to the definition of an architect. Um, and we're, we're interested, I think, emotionally and temperamentally with architecture that has a strong public engagement. Because for us, that's the great gift of architecture. It's not just to make a beautiful house 
that is hidden in some kind of beautiful setting, but it's really to make an architecture that can address issues that uh, our contemporary society are facing, uh, issues of globalization, issues of, of economic disparity, the difference between rich and poor. Those are things that, that architecture can have an immediate and very visceral impact on. So for us, the engagement in social issues is crucial. I think our architects actually have a very, very unique background, and you described in Chile the fact that there are so many different architects educated who may not have job opportunities to do what we conventionally call architecture. And I think the conventional definition of architecture is too narrow. It's to build something that is a landmark, for instance. But what architects do is that they are the most synthetic thinkers and makers out there because what we are asked to do at all times is to take completely disparate things that are both measurable and immeasurable and actually give form and direction and place to something that nobody may have ever thought existed or should be given measure or shape. So when you think about that background that we have, which is to be prepared to take action through learning, research, uh, uh, being almost contingency-based sometimes to be able to still have a, a clarity of vision, to make choices, to curate, uh, to lead, in fact, those are all roles of an architect, whether or not a building is the final outcome. So what you're doing, for instance, which is a broadcast communication, is very much at the heart of what architecture does, which is to gather, curate, communicate, and construct a broader understanding than anybody might have without an architect there to be able to give a measure. That's a good question, and I think um, the architects we liked, like uh, Alvar Aalto, um, influenced us to think of that, that each project is a form of research. So there's always, uh, I think, in each project, whether it's the design of a chair or design of a park or design of a, of a, uh, a room, there's an opportunity to innovate. At the same time, I think what we're also seeing, which is very interesting, is with each experiment there's an opportunity to learn. So I think, as you said, innovation or doing something different just to do something different isn't of value, but the opportunity to build on a piece or a, a, a body of research that is part of each project for us is, is essential. So we hope that in each project there's something that we haven't done before, either in terms of material research like glass or in terms of uh, seismic research in the Olympic Sculpture Park. So we try with each project to move in an area that, that we haven't done before, but also to understand that what we did and what other architects are doing is part of a larger conversation. And I think as architects we need to share that research and we hope that each research project is unique but also has a larger capacity to communicate. It, it seems that at times, as, as, as we discussed before, each project uh, necessitates uh, a level of production and we use the necessity of production as an excuse to do research. So for instance, in our Barnard College project, we were very interested in creating something that would perhaps collaborate with the fact that the campus was all brick but that it would have something very, very forward-looking. Well, that then postponed a conclusion about materiality, but gave us this whole uh, incentive to research the capacity of glass, for instance, not to be invisible, but to have great tactile chromatic materiality. So the aspirations in each project set with it the potential then to try and test something new, and that innovation came out of this kind of broadcast question and some knowledge that we've been building in any case uh, associated with glass. Well, I guess I think we're, we're both nodding because I think it's, it's uh, good, but we've also, you know, we, we've also seen um, architects who are so obsessed with networking that they kind of forget that in the end you have to have some idea to network with. So I think for us, networking is always a, a kind of a balance between 
generating ideas or absorbing ideas and then communicating those ideas. So maybe um, rather than network, the word network, maybe we could think of the word conversation. Um, and in that sense, it's very important for us in our work to have a broad conversation with architects and designers and artists um, because the idea of conversation then means that two people are throwing ideas back and forth and so in that sense it is a global conversation is like a network so we like that idea um, and we appreciate the need to have a kind of a network of, of thoughts that go back and forth Sometimes I think, as, as, as we've discovered, is many people network, but there are no ideas. And I think the, the, the challenge for us, I think, in contemporary culture, is to make sure that the content of the networking is elevated. I think networks are, by their nature, always changing. And the thing that's so remarkable about being part of a network is there's no such thing as a network. There's several, they overlap, they braid together at different times under the guise of a certain imperative or a certain set of questions. But the important thing about a network is that it remains open, organic, and generous. And in fact, I think we've been huge beneficiaries, even uh, academically, when networks start to break away from their administrative uh, boundaries. We actually, at the University of Pennsylvania, have a faculty member who has a joint appointment in biology and architecture. And the conversation about, say, cell growth in cancer has some visual relevance to the kind of generative programs we actually are more masters of in architecture than they might be for visualization. So that's a case of a network that's not just uh, tied to a disciplinary boundary, but a much broader conversation. So these ideas of network becoming pluralized becomes especially important and interesting. Well, yeah, do you want to start? I have uh, some thoughts. I mean, in, in some ways we don't even think about the importance of the internet in some ways because it's almost, it's now become so so ingrained in how we work and how we communicate um, that in some ways I think what we we don't even think about whether it's there or not it's it's I think present in um, our lives and how we work I think that the, the way to, to challenge ourselves and I think challenge you and, and other architects is you know what's the qualitative role of the internet in how we do good work? And that, I think, is the big question, is not the internet or not, but qualitatively, how can it make us um, smarter, more generous? How can it increase the kind of networks and the quality of work we do? I think the internet is actually, uh, like anything, it's, it's become very organic. It is now part of our bloodstreams, and you could say it's part yeah. of, and even greater part of, people's bloodstreams who have been born into this and never known it not existing. Uh, and it offers sort of two sides of a coin. One, it offers such a vast amount of information that being able to discern where to go or how to find it or how to curate it or how to use it properly, how to know what's accurate versus what's been promoted actively, those are all things that we now need to become much more agile at trying to assess. So that's sort of the, the complicated side of it. But the upside of it is that when there's something very compelling that we want to learn more about, we may feel that we're the only ones who want to learn about it or the only ones who've been engaged in it. And as we start to do greater research, when we find out that there's people maybe in London who've been doing it very aggressively and ambitiously and at a very high level, but it may not be so overtly apparent to us here, all of a sudden we have access to a level of intelligence, expertise, and experience that we wouldn't have access to before. That elevates all of our explorations. So it, mm -hmm. it stands to both elevate but also complicate uh, the way we operate in the world. 
Yeah. It's a, actually a very interesting question, and, and we could spend hours talking about it, but it's a tool of, of great liberation. I think we all recognize that. And I think as we enter the sort of second era of the Internet, um, the qualitative aspects will start to be measured and how the Internet actually um, um, gives us a, a kind of set of, of qualitative choices will be, I think, the next era. It places a burden on people learning how to navigate, how to find where their information may be curated, how to find sources that they can rely on versus sources that uh, they may not want to rely on, and how to actually uh, yeah. keep conversations incisive. It becomes very interesting, too, though, as an environment that demands so much maintenance that sometimes the level of stimulation becomes a level of distraction, too. And so that, uh, what does the Internet mean? It means many, many things, but ultimately, like all things, it needs to be choreographed with care. There, there, are, there are so many different ways to enter the world of architecture, and one track that some people take is that they have this burning itch to make and find themselves involved in the world of making very, very early on and find their way into architecture that way. Others have a more cerebral uh, general appreciation, say, of the way uh, cities are shaped, the way a community is built, the legacy of, of time. And others may just think, it's something that they want to learn more about. And since we both teach, the, the thing that we like to ask of our students or potential students is that they stay as open and as curious about as broadcast a set of things as they possibly can, because architecture is not just about this, but it's about a panoramic capacity to make choices and see and be open um, and to synthesize. With, with more in mind than might be manifest in what we make. And the biggest recommendation we could make to somebody who's interested in architecture is to not limit their understanding of what architecture is so soon that their mm. intellectual and cultural inquiry gets tapered to something too narrow. It's interesting, and in, in now that we've both taught at different institutions for many years, the thing that comes into my mind, and we've seen students come from preparatory schools where they taught architecture, we've seen students who were older who came from medicine or from business, and the thing that, I think, actually it's a great question, because the thing that stands out is the students, the advice we would give is, is have passion, and if you feel that passion for architecture, however you define it, and if you feel curiosity, those are the two things that we say when we see that in students, if they're young, they're old, whatever, that's the thing that you suddenly get excited about as a teacher, curiosity and passion. And if a student has those two things, then I think the excitement of architecture can only grow. And the other thing, too, is that we should never underestimate our hunches of what we think and believe in, but we need to invest in those hunches and work unbelievably hard to get to the bottom of what those hunches might yield. And we should never, yeah. ever underestimate the capacity of what one person can do or say or impact and recognize that we are part of a very, very big world and we need to think big and think big about our capacity to lead. <laughs> uh, we need several hours, several days for this. I think that's a, uh, that's a really good question. I, I think it's also uh, tied to what it takes to be a student of architecture. And I think to make a practice or to establish yourself in, in anything still requires great curiosity and great passion. And I think it's important when we talk to other architects who we who we admire or whose work is good, you can still see that curiosity and that passion. And it's very important, I think, for us, Marion and myself, to be reminded continually that that curiosity can't, can't be narrowed as you become more experienced or as you grow. And that's a very important thing because there's, 
there's something about making architecture, whether it's in the form of a book or a city, that requires um, a, a kind of idea of naivete, a freshness, not so much experience. You have to be some, somehow still fresh, and it's very important to not lose that quality as you progress. Otherwise, you repeat yourself or you assume that you know too much. And that innocence, I think, the word innocence is very important if you're going to continue as a, as a firm, as an architect, to do interesting work. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to think about how do you begin a practice. I think everybody begins in different ways. Opportunities show up in different ways. Sometimes it can be an opportunity to do a project that's pro bono, and that's how we begin our, our work together, which was doing a few uh, pro bono projects in Harlem for a school, a community center, low-income housing. And they were ways to, for us to begin a conversation. And from that, that led to doing competitions. And what we loved about doing competitions was that we were being asked the most ambitious questions. Competitions ask big questions. And we actually developed the opportunity to sort of figure out what our values were and what, what could respond to those. Uh, but we've always felt that each time that we're at the beginning again, and here we are now after so many years still feeling it at the beginning of every project that we're starting all over again. Maybe that's not a terrible thing to be at the beginning each time.